gracious, hello. Here at the phone company, we handle 84 billion calls a year, serving everyone from presidents and kings to the scum of the earth. So we realize that every so often, you can't get an operator. For no apparent reason, your phone goes out of order. Perhaps you've been charged for a call you didn't make. We don't care. Oh, watch this. Just lost Peoria. You see, this phone system consists of a multi-billion dollar matrix of space-age technology that is so sophisticated that even we can't handle it. But that's your problem, isn't it? So the next time you complain about your phone service, why don't you try using two Dixie cups with a string? We don't care. We don't have to. We're the phone company. So, you know, the reason that clip was humorous is because it has an underlying truth about a very commonly shared experience of frustration uh, that, that many of you of a certain age in this room will remember. You, you might not remember that clip, but you certainly remember what it was like living under a communications monopoly. Uh, you remember Ma Bell, and probably not too fondly. Uh, you will remember that in the late 1970s, early 1980s, a 10-minute long-distance phone call cost, on average, $3.50, and that's $8 in today's money. $8 for a 10-minute phone call. Now today that kind of rate seems outrageous when you can use services like Skype and get unlimited local and long distance calling uh, to all parts of North America for just three bucks a month. And even with AT&T today, that same 10-minute call on their worst plan would set you back only about 70 cents. That's about 90% less than what it was before the 1984 breakup of Ma Bell into a long distance company and seven regional Baby Bell local monopoly phone companies. But even though we've had tremendous advances in technology in the last 30 years, this drop in rates just can't be chalked up to technological progress alone. It's due a lot more to more competition and more choice. This new competition drove down prices and spurred and incentivized technological innovations that in turn increased choice and furthered this virtuous competitive cycle. But that competition was only made possible because of changes in regulatory policy. And at the center of that policy is the Communications Act, first written in 1934 and last overhauled in a major way in 1996, which is what we're here today to discuss. Now, the 1996 rewrite started many, many years before the law was signed by President Clinton. And the calls to overhaul the law actually came very shortly after the 1984 breakup of Ma Bell. And as is the case today, those calls came from all parties, uh, including the baby bells themselves, who just a few short years after having their local monopoly status reaffirmed, were looking for a way out of regulations that were on paper supposed to keep their market power in check. Now, we'll talk more in a minute about what the thinking was like in the real time in the 90s in a moment, but the bumper sticker purpose of the 1996 Act was the creation of more competition. But as is the case with, with these things, this legislation became bigger and bigger as more issues and in some case more corporate wish lists were added to the pile. Now this grab bag approach is how we got the massive deregulations that unleashed a huge wave of consolidation in the radio and broadcast television markets somehow inexplicably pushed through the, under the umbrella of creating more competition in media and communications markets. But I think the disconnect with what the 96 Act did in broadcasting aside, the, re the 1996 rewrite of the 1934 law was about breaking down artificial barriers to competition. It was about finding places where phone and cable companies had market power and removing that market power. It was about convergence and getting phone and cable companies to compete with each other and creating many new wired and wireless competitors to compete against the phone and cable companies. And though it's assumed otherwise, it actually was about unleashing the power of the internet. Uh, it was about preserving and extending the, pr the principle of non-discrimination, which is at the cornerstone of common carriage law, uh, preserving that principle in order to ensure that all this great stuff happening on the internet would continue to grow and thrive. But even though convergence was a bud buzzword at the time, the 1996 Act was still just an amendment to the 1934 law, a big amendment, but it did keep many of the core components of that old law in place, and some probably deservingly so. The biggest preservation was the structure of the law itself, the so-called silo model, where two-way communications networks are governed in one legal silo, one-way cable and satellite television in another silo, uh, 
and the broadcast and radio television communications that happen over the public airwaves and other things involving public airwaves in yet another silo. And the tension between trying to create you know, convergence and a cross-platform of competition, tension between that and different regulatory oversight rules depending on what the transmission medium was, led almost immediately to calls to rewrite the law yet again shortly after it passed. And the fact that industry was able to use their political and legal muscle to get out from under the parts of the law they didn't like has led others to call for a new Communications Act to strengthen the regulatory oversight of these communications giants who do possess a substantial amount of market power. So these calls for a rewrite have been growing, led most loudly on the industry by, for example, Verizon's top lobbyist, uh, Tom Talkey, who as a former member of Congress was in 1987 one of the representatives leading the charge to rewrite the 1934 Act in order to deregulate the phone company. So the more things change, yada, 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 right? <clears throat> so that's what we're here today to talk about. Is Verizon right? Should we rewrite the law? And if so, how? If not, how can we get the current law working for the public interest and not just the big corporate interest again? So we're very fortunate to have a very distinguished panel with us today. Th this is not Congressman Mike Doyle sitting right here. Uh, unfortunately, Congressman Doyle was doing his, uh, his duties to keep the government uh, funded and running for another week uh, and then for a scheduled vote next Thursday on a, on a longer term deal. So uh, I think that the votes were still happening in the wee hours of the morning. So he's in transit. He will be making the later session today uh, in the main room. But uh, in his place, uh, representing uh, uh, who work, works for Congressman Mike Doyle is Kenneth DeGraff. Um, Kenneth uh, has, has been with Mike Doyle for five years, uh, uh, one of his top telecom staffers. He's now uh, in his last week with uh, Congressman Doyle, and he's transitioning on to be a, a telecom policy advisor to uh, uh, Leader Pelosi, who was here yesterday. Um, but under, under, under Mr. Doyle, Kenneth has seen a lot of great things happen for consumers. Uh, most of you might know uh, Congressman Doyle through his work on the Local Community Radio Act. This certainly made him a, a, a hero of the low-power <laughs> FM community. Uh, a, a very rare example of a, a bipartisan bill that, that finally did uh, do some good in this world. Um, we're also uh, fortunate enough to have Colin Crowell with us. Uh, he's a former, he's out in the end, a former longtime staffer to Congressman Ed Markey, another one of those rare champions of the public interest, uh, one who was very influential in the creation of the 96 Act uh, and the provisions designed to create real competition in that law. Uh, Colin also spent a year as a top advisor to FCC Chairman Julius Janikowski, something I'm sure some folks might have some questions about. Uh, Colin now has his own consulting shop where he continues to work on these issues from the outside, and if you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you too can hire Crawl Strategies, LLC. <laughs> and we're also very pleased to have Professor Susan Crawford from Cardozo Law School with us. Uh, Susan is a very prolific writer and thinker in telecom and media policy issues, and her expertise was put to good use when she was tapped to serve uh, in the White House as Special Assistant to the President for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. After le leaving the White House, Susan has been doing lots of great work and thinking on an issue, issue that I think actually is central to the discussion of the rewrite of the Telecom Act, and that's the issue surrounding the future of the online video market and how industry structure and market power could potentially distort that future. So I'm very excited about our lineup and our topic, and I'm glad all of you came out today. Um, so I'm going to start with, with, with Colin here. Uh, you know, we had the benefit of having someone in the room who was actually there in the years leading up to the rewrite of the Telecom Act in 1996. So, you know, Colin, can you just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what was, the, what was the thinking like leading up to the Act? Why, why was there a push to, the re, to do a rewrite? Uh, what were the motivations? And, and just explain a little bit about what Congressman Markey was focused on and, and perhaps a little bit perspective on how it went. Sure. Thank you. Um, and I love that you started out with Ernestine uh, because it really encapsulates uh, a lot of what we were doing uh, when we were leading up to the Telecom Act because there was um, uh, uh, various sources of frustration. Uh, consumers were frustrated with the lack of choices and uh, people, it, it's hard to imagine today uh, what the reality was on the ground. So when the ink was dry on the Telecom Act of 1996, there wasn't a single residential consumer in the country who had residential broadband service. Uh, it wasn't offered uh, to uh, individual residential households. There was frustration with that on the part of many members of Congress and a lot of technologists uh, because they knew that DSL technology had existed for some 10 years prior to the passage of the Act. 
uh, and a lot of the technologies weren't being rolled out. A lot of the services weren't being priced in an affordable way. And uh, uh, part of the impetus for the act was to uh, get rid of the barriers uh, that prevented uh, companies and other entities from getting into the marketplace to offer consumers uh, real choices and to spark the innovation that we have seen uh, really change the world. So going back to Ernestine, uh, if you go back to uh, the, the breakup of Ma Bell, it resulted in the creation of seven baby bells and AT&T long distance. And so on the ground, essentially, you had seven baby bells plus GTE. You had three major long distance companies, AT&T, MCI, and Sprint. Uh, you had dozens of other smaller long distance companies. You had, uh, in, the, in the late 1980s, you had the forerunners of what would become uh, internet service providers, uh, information service providers like Prodigy and CompuServe and uh, America Online uh, in, its, in its nascent uh, stage. Uh, a big uh, group of folks who were very interested in the, in the laws that would um, uh, be changed uh, 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 on information services and whether or not the baby bells could get into that line of uh, business were the newspaper publishers. Uh, the newspaper publishers had correctly identified that the threat to their business uh, was an attack on their classified ad revenue, uh, and they were fearful uh, that bell companies getting into the information service uh, um, uh, business uh, would uh, uh, compete and poach into that business in a way that would dilute their ability to uh, make ends meet, so to speak. Uh, having correctly identified the threat, um, they misdiagnosed uh, who would actually be uh, the real uh, culprit in threatening, threatening their um, business model, and it, it was uh, Craigslist, uh, not uh, the phone companies. And so looking back at that time frame, uh, what you had was the Bell companies, uh, the, the seven baby Bells were petitioning Congress to change the law. And they wanted the law changed because the, the court had prohibited them from getting into the long-distance business, the information service business and the um, uh, long, uh, long distance and manufacturing, those three lines of business, manufacturing, long distance, and information services. So they wanted to just get rid of the uh, consent decree and get rid of the rules. The long distance industry um, was very eager, uh, if the bells were going to get into long distance, to get back into the local uh, phone business. The cable industry was very wary about the fact uh, that the Bell companies might also uh, get Congress to overturn the prohibition on them getting into the video business. Uh, and so the cable guys also wanted to get into the local phone business. And uh, the newspaper publishers and, and, and consumer groups and public interests and others were concerned about Bell entry into information services and whether or not they would favor their own services and the like. And so there was a uh, a desire to make sure that the historic common carriage type principles uh, were reaffirmed, and, uh, uh, and that was a big part of the debate uh, as well. And so as we led up to the 1996 Telecom Act, the thing to remember uh, historically is that there were, there were sort of several stages to it. And the first stage that I recall uh, was uh, uh, what led up to the act. In 1992, Congress passed the Cable Act of 1992, that provided competition to the incumbent cable companies from satellite services because the program access provisions meant that the, uh, what would become the DISH network and DirecTV uh, would um, uh, uh, be able to uh, get the programming they needed to effectively compete. The other thing that the Cable Act of 1992 did, which was very, very important, which is often overlooked, uh, in addition to program access, is Congress vitiated all exclusive franchise agreements in communities across the country because the cable industry had succeeded in getting most municipalities to grant them exclusives. And so even if you had changed the, the law, the locals were uh, often um, bound up with exclusive franchises with their incumbent cable operator and you couldn't get another choice anyway. So Congress had to essentially vitiate those exclusive franchises. In 1993, Congress in the first Clinton budget moved over uh, 200 megahertz of spectrum to create competition to the wireless cellular duopoly. Uh, 
So in 92 and 93, Congress was beginning to change the laws about uh, a couple of the other incumbent industries. This is important later when we get to the 96 Act. Two other things happened. In 1992, Congress also voted to um, commercialize uh, and make the internet publicly available. And so uh, at the time it was under a National Science Foundation, uh, uh, Aegis, and that act in Congress uh, uh, directed NSF to allow uh, you know, the public uh, to use it. And so what happened then is you had Mosaic and you had other folks start to experiment and, uh, and uh, uh, look at the internet as something that was a public asset and a public resource, including the private sector and commercial entities. Then in 1993, as we began the Congress to look again at changing these laws, in the telecom subcommittee, Markey called uh, the first hearing on it. And the first witness at the first hearing in 1993 uh, that we called uh, was uh, the CEO, uh, John Scully, of Apple Computer. And I remember sitting behind Markey up on the dais at the hearing, and you could almost see the phone and cable lobbyists all looking at each other saying, what does a computer guy have to do with our business? And so, because it was all about changing the laws and rules for them, uh, but Scully was very compelling and talked about how if you allowed, uh, if you got digital services broadband services to residential consumers, you could turn the PC into something that wasn't a standalone island, but that would be connected with other PCs and would, and would connect. He also showed something at the hearing uh, that he called the Apple Newton, um, which uh, some of you may remember, um, but looks eerily like the iPad uh, tablet of today, uh, just 20 years uh, uh, earlier. That hearing then led to a series of hearings. We held 14 hearings um, and uh, went through the process to change, uh, to change the laws. And essentially what we did is we paradoxed each industry. And this is very important. We paradoxed the industry by agreeing to their request. When the phone company said they wanted to get into long distance, they wanted to get into the video business, they wanted to get into manufacturing and information services, we said, sure. The condition was is that everybody else's requests would also be agreed to. The cable companies would be able to get into the local phone business. The long distance companies would also be able to get into the local phone business. Anybody would be able to get into the information services business because the networks would be wide open. And so that paradox um, is what we, we were able to do to bring everybody together in, 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 in semi-consensus. In 1993 and 1994, through the House, we passed a bill that said that the goal of policy in the United States was that all uh, Americans, uh, regardless of uh, uh, region, uh, should have affordable access uh, to broadband policy, to broadband service. Um, notwithstanding that, many people, after the act was passed, um, for their own narrow interests, would say that it was just about voice and the long distance business, because a lot of the lobbying was around that. But the act was about going digital. We included the E-rate provision to hook up schools and public libraries uh, to the internet. Uh, and so we were very keen on making sure that the, that the benefits of the competition would flow to consumers and the benefits of that um, uh, internet broadband service would also be accessible to everybody. When we, uh, we passed that through the House, it didn't make it through the Senate in that session. In 1994, in November, um, uh, the Republicans won the House and Senate. What happened in the next Congress, 95 and 96, led to the Telecom Act successfully being signed into law by President Clinton. The work that we had done leading up to that over a series of years kept consensus on the core issues. The Republicans, when they came in, they added two other ideas, which is then what we fought about for those two years in 95, 96. It was deregulating cable rates, before effective competition showed up, and there was a debate over that and the timing. And the second was the desire uh, on the part of the, um, many of the House Republicans to get rid of uh, the mass media ownership rules. Um, and so we had a big debate about that. Under the threat of a presidential veto, we were able to negotiate uh, a resolution to those issues uh, and, and pass the act. When you talk about the silos, what I would say is that paradox of letting the phone guys into cable and cable into phone, uh, 
recalling that uh, almost half the states in 1996 had state laws or state regulations that prohibited competition to their local phone company. So the phone company succeeded in going to state utility commissions and state legislatures to prohibit competition uh, within those states. So we had to preempt the states on the question of entry. Getting all that paradox done uh, 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 effectively broke down the silos that had existed. And so whether, whether you used to be a cable company or you used to be a long distance company or a local phone company, if you were in the local phone business, we would treat you um, as if you were providing uh, that service. Whether you used to be a, a, a telephone company or a cable company or you were a new entrant and you wanted to get into the video business, we would treat you the same regardless of your historic antecedents. And so as all the services went digital and you got into broadband, everybody's broadband would be treated the same, whether you were a cable operator or, or a phone company. The initial implementation of the congressional directives was very strong and led to a, a, uh, a dramatic growth in broadband services uh, for the American people. What happened over time, however, is that even though Congress had broken down the silos in the law and had let all of the different industries cross-pollinate, so to speak, into each other's markets, the commission remained siloed in its structure and in its implementation. So over time, that became uh, where a lot of uh, issues then developed because the cable bureau or the media bureau would be a, uh, a place where cable companies would go to seek uh, 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 regulatory advantages and the so-called common carrier bureau, which now has become the competition bureau, uh, would be where you know phone company issues were dealt with, even though the law had tried to collapse them uh, into being treated the same. And so that siloed effect in the imp on the implementation side, over time, I think, uh, you know, really uh, had the effect of pulling the industries back into different camps and seeking regulatory advantage um, based upon which bureau was going to work on their issue. And so one of the things that we didn't do in the Telecom Act, looking back, that we probably should have done while we were changing all the laws, we should have reformed the FCC at the same time so that it would be a 21st century agency having changed the law to reflect 21st century digital uh, technologies. And with that, I'll leave it there. Great. <clears throat> well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that, that, that the, the act did seem to be somewhat successful in, in creating its vision of competition in the late 1990s. Certainly, there was a tremendous increase in the amount of investment in infrastructure um, to, to where you know, communications infrastructure was a substantial portion uh, of the growth in GDP in the late 1990s. Um, but that kind of unraveled. And, and so and shortly after that, we started hearing all these calls about the rewrite. So uh, Susan, what has changed since 1996 to, to, to make a rewrite needed? And, and do you think we do need to, to revisit this? It's very important to have Colin here because we tend to have an ahistorical amnesiac approach to these issues. I, and I, it's clear that Colin and his boss got it right in many important ways. Um, this idea of opening up the local loop, encouraging uh, uh, open access competition to local facilities is embedded in the act and gave rise to a huge growth in broadband access for Americans. And we. We just can't forget that. The technology doesn't just emerge on its own. Sometimes it has to be encouraged through laws and regulations that create a level playing field. And that's what Colin and his boss were trying to do. Since then, a few key things have happened to cause the unraveling that we're seeing today. I think Colin's point about the siloed nature of the FCC is very important. Um, since then, the internet has become our common medium. So where we used to have an important post office, an important phone system, an important broadcast system, much of that is falling away to become just bits running over uh, local uh, transmission facilities. And yet the, um, uh, the sort of regulatory construct for those transmission facilities was subject to intensive gaming by the companies involved. Um, so what we have now, just to give the big headline, is a system that systematically underserves 
a lot of America in the provision of internet access, while at the same time uh, being very heavily concentrated in metropolitan areas to the point where we have a single provider in most cities in America for high-speed internet access, who is our local cable company. I don't think that Colin could have anticipated at, in 96 that that was going to happen, uh, but cable came up with the best technology for high-speed two-way data transfer and held on de facto to the exclusive franchises that uh, Congress had tried to get rid of. It's just too difficult to enter into these markets and compete with cable. They never compete with each other, these giant carriers. Uh, they've divided up the country in the summer of love following the um, passage of the Telecom Act, 1997. They said, all right, you take Minneapolis, I'll take Sacramento. And they uh, clustered their systems uh, for good economic reasons for them. It's a lot less expensive uh, to run a back office facility over a, a clustered region than it would be to have lots of individual systems battling it out with each other. So underserved areas in, in a lot of America and very heavily concentrated market power in metropolitan areas leading to an absence of competition for many of the things, uh, markets that Colin was trying to open up. If you've got a single gatekeeper um, in major metropolitan areas able to dictate what comes over its wires and how that's charged for, um, competition becomes extremely difficult uh, with an enormous amount of uh, market power. Um, what also has happened is that Colin wasn't able to anticipate the people who would be involved in <laughs> regulation. Uh, uh, I think there's been a, almost a willful misreading of the categories that Colin set up in the act with the rest of Congress. I don't mean to say that Colin did it all alone, but I, he, he had a lot to do with the 1996 Act. Um, so that this notion of a general telecommunication service, which was technology neutral, not, couldn't be, wasn't just necessarily a phone company or a cable company, the central notion of a basic telecommunication service became a subject of intensive lobbying at the commission and 10 years of litigation in the end leading to the deregulatory uh, context we see today, where high-speed internet access is subject to no constraints of either competition or regulation. And they could not have anticipated the personnel who would be in charge at the commission uh, from 2002 uh, onward to make that deregulation happen despite the regulatory category set up in the act. So um, heavy concentration in urban markets, the advantage of cable, the fact that the dreamed for competition in essential facilities, uh, for example, we, everybody was dreaming that phone would compete with cable for access and everybody be competing with wireless. That has turned out not to be true. Cable has such an advantage in the wired infrastructure that only Verizon's Fios can compete and they're backing off. So we're, we've missed the boat on the uh, competition for transmission facilities. Wireless, we're making a lot of uh, advances there, but it's, these are two separate markets as between wired and wireless access. So uh, the silos fell away, technology changed, cable won the battle, and we had a, a deregulatory atmosphere at the commission uh, favored by some very credulous courts uh, that got us to the position we're in today and uh, makes us all think that we need to be a bit more specific in the next rewrite of the Telecommunications Act. So, Kenneth, you, um, <clears throat> you've, uh, you've, been in con you've been working in Congress for a little while. You've been uh, with, my, with Congressman Mike Doyle, both in the majority and the minority, uh, and now you're about to go advise uh, Leader Pelosi on these issues. Uh, a lot of folks may not remember this, but the 96 Act was a very bipartisan uh, affair. It, it, had, it had almost unanimous support uh, in, bo in both houses, and, and you had you know, people like uh, Senator Larry Pressler making very st important statements. I don't think you would hear statements like these today uh, to the effect of uh, there's a difference between being pro-free market and being pro-big business. We need to be pro-free market, not necessarily pro-big business. Um, but it seems things have changed a little bit in Washington over the years, and it seems things are, are very partisan, partisan now. And, and frankly, with all due respect, even many members of your party uh, sometimes seem to take positions that are, that are in conflict with the public interest. So what are the prospects uh, right now for, for good public interest policymaking if the Telecom Act is revisited? 
Well, thanks, Derek. Um, I think there might be some sort of mistake. I actually was prepared for the how comedy can help reform the media panel. And um, so I, my notes are going to be somewhat different than what I was expecting. Although if you want uh, Communications Act jokes, I'm sure I'll be sure to share them with you after this panel. <coughs> um, but what I would say, though, is, is how difficult it is to pass laws in Congress. And so Colin briefly mentioned um, the how, how, how the, the bills started, the, the, the work did earnest for the 96 Act started in 1984. Um, this morning we were talking about in another workshop um, how the low power FM movement took 10 years to get from original idea to final congressional implementation, and it's about six months away from final agency implementation at the FCC. Um, and so in the, in the absence of the ability for Congress to act with a clear voice, you requ we require a strong FCC to enact their mandate to protect the public interest. Um, and the, the FCC has been a disappointment of late because the votes that have been taken have been so partisan. And, and have been three to, two ver, uh, three to two votes for the past few years on major, major pieces of, 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 of the commission action. In terms of Congress this year, um, it's worth noting the first piece of legislation that the Subcommittee on uh, Communications and Technology introduced, which was the Congressional Review Act to overturn the recent net neutrality order at the FCC. Um, that could potentially leave the commission powerless to protect consumers on the internet and it passed the House uh, last, I guess it's last night, or night before last, um, with a pretty strong margin, but also a very partisan margin, um, with only six Dems uh, voting for it and two Republicans voting against it. Um, so there's a, within the parties we see now, instead of these issues being bipartisan, but more regional, where you know, or more pro-business, or I, I guess more, not necessarily pro-business, but more free market versus pro-competition um, and, and embracing the notion that competition can actually serve consumers in a, in a, in a reasonable way. Um, now we see network operators taking credit for innovation provided by others and showing off wireless devices that allow for neat things to do and having the network operators take credit for that as if they had created it when in reality they stand in a position to be able to control and restrict that kind of innovation that happens over their devices that they sell. Um, and members don't necessarily have the tools to, kn to know the difference. And uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but um, I think there's a, there's a, I hope the boat hasn't left for, bi for meaningful bipartisan telecommunications reform. Um, but it's going to take a little bit more, a little more time for that to develop. Well, you know, I, I, I certainly, it's, it's easy to be pessimistic about this, but, you know, a, a lot of the folks uh, who are on the relevant, uh, the relevant committees in Congress, some of them were there in the past, and some of them have made past statements about showing that they did have genuine concern about market power. And if you watch a hearing lately, they're really concerned about Google's market power, but uh, don't seem to care too much about other market power. Um, so it, it's, I, I could see a discussion happening through the lens of market power, and you do hear this happening a lot that, you know, isn't antitrust an, enough to, to deal with this? So, and it isn't the Com Act right now just too complicated? It's, you know, it's reams and reams long. It has, you know, seven, eight titles, whatever it is, and, and, and a lot of it's antiquated. So, Susan, you know, why couldn't we just reduce the Telecom Act to sort of a Sherman Act like one page constitution? I think what we need to get closer to is, is some idea as a country that it's possible to have genuinely disinterested public interest utility regulation, right? That it's possible to imagine an expert agency uh, able to be agile enough to deal with shifting technology and circumstances facing it, um, but uh, to be always acting in the public service and thinking of internet access as a utility that all Americans should have. In that context, a one-line um, uh, Sherman Act-like statute probably wouldn't make sense. We've got this continuum. We've got antitrust way over here, all post hoc, lots of litigation, extremely expensive. Everything goes to courts, lots of discretion there. Sometimes that works well for the public interest, sometimes not. On the other edge, you've got the copyright statute, which is impenetrable, and you have to call up the staffers who worked on the statute to understand what the details are and what they mean for your 
clients, somewhere in the middle is the sweet spot for the FCC, an expert agency that uh, is given discretion to confront market power issues, but is not left to doing everything after the fact. And why? Uh, because there's so many nascent industries who are at risk of being strangled by gatekeepers for communication. And there's so much speech that's at risk of being stopped or chilled because of control over communications infrastructure. So because of the nature of communications as a basic affordance for everybody, that's what it should be, um, a sufficiently detailed statute to allow the expert agency to do its work before the fact is needed. And relegating everything to litigation in the courts will drag us far away from this basic model, model of disinterested public utility regulation. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think actually certain parts of the act are not as ambiguous as, as some would, would pretend they are. I, I just think sometimes the problem may be with the regulators themselves. And Colin, you you sort of alluded to this, and there was a panel before ours across the way that, that did deal with the issue of regulatory capture. Um, and, and, and Colin, you talked about how the, the, the siloing of the bureaus and the, the ability for companies to come and, and have their pleadings in front of the bureaus was a way to, to partially undo the act in addition to what happened in the courts, as Susan mentioned. Um, so my question for you as someone who's been both in Congress and at the FCC uh, in a senior uh, capacity, is regulatory capture a real problem? Uh, and what can be done to ensure the FCC properly protects the public interest under the law, be it the current or a future law? Well, you know, I'm sort of reminded, um, you know, when thinking of the FCC and how it's and how it's structured, um, uh, there was this line uh, many years ago that uh, Mitch Caper uh, uh, was reportedly said that uh, when talking about networks, said architecture is policy. It's the same thing with bureaucratic uh, uh, architecture too, um, because the architecture of uh, the the agency affects policy, and in fact, when I was there, um, it was not um, uh, a surprise that when we were developing the national broadband plan, uh, it was important to have cross bureau uh, teams working on different aspects of it. These cross-bureau teams and task forces are now becoming more and more routine because the structure of the agency doesn't make sense anymore for uh, the day-to-day -day work that it has to do. And so uh, it's the same, and, and Kenneth and I are familiar with this in, in Congress, uh, if you get down into the, uh, uh, the, the parliamentary uh, weeds of uh, jurisdiction of committees and subcommittees, depending on how you write a particular uh, bill, it gets referred to one committee or another committee and then to one subcommittee of that committee or, or a different subcommittee. And even though your end goal may be to achieve the same thing, how you write it um, can make a world of difference about your prospects for success or not. Uh, if it goes to one committee or another committee. Or uh, the mistake, uh, the worst mistake a staffer can make, you write it in a way so that it goes to both committees. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and so from that standpoint, you know, looking at, uh, you know, looking at the agency and looking at, um, uh, at the Congress, uh, there's a yin and yang, and I think the answer, uh, uh, you know, to, you know, how do you affect positive change in Congress and how do you affect uh, 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 how do you ensure that the agency is doing its job, uh, as Susan said, in, in, in a dispassionate way uh, with respect to regulatees, um, is to make sure that the Klieg lights of the public are on uh, the agency and, 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 and the Congress as they work on these issues, that that transparency is vitally important. Um, that uh, you should know, and this has been my experience, and I'm sure uh, the experience of many people in the room who have worked uh, with the FCC, you have superlative staffers at that agency, and they are gifts uh, to public service. Uh, the fact that they continue to work there uh, is really uh, remarkable, and we should be thankful for, uh, for their service. And I would say the same thing uh, with respect to many of the, uh, uh, you know, the people who work in Congress and, and the staff in Congress. Uh, 
who are very public spirited and work uh, very hard on the issues that they work on, making sure that the decision makers uh, at the top of the food chain are calling the shots in a way uh, that reflect uh, the, the, the benefits that would flow to the American people, that's really the job of the rest of us uh, to make sure that that happens. Uh, because uh, if not, uh, what happens is, is then it is uh, uh, an inside the beltway uh, dialogue, uh, and in that uh, scenario, uh, you know, oftentimes the, uh, uh, the 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 corporate corporate interests have a uh, very pronounced uh, presence uh, inside the Beltway, and making sure that the debate becomes a more widespread debate and gets beyond that uh, uh, to the public uh, is very important for success. That is. Um, I think true in many of the things that um, you know we've actually achieved success on. Uh, if you look at the successes that we've had in public policy, you can almost draw a causal connecting principle to the fact that the public knew that the debate was going on um, to uh, to our success. <coughs> That's true, and certainly uh, you know, from the free press members uh, in particular who write and call and groups like Public Knowledge to send people into the record certainly are, are trying to make sure that folks are aware of these issues and, and certainly folks like yourself who used to be inside are, are aware of what the public's thinking on this. But, you know, let, let's be honest, the, the diffuse, the public interest is diffuse often, you know. And part of our group's role was to help organize that, that, that you know, public interest opinion. But certainly the, the public interest is not always at the center of policy debates in Washington. Um, and these debates are often driven by the well-organized and well-funded big business interests. And, um, I personally am a little worried about what's going to happen to the public interest protections uh, in the law if there is a rewrite of the act. In the 1990s, uh, we had the giants, as you mentioned, of you know, AT&T and MCI on one side trying to pry open the Baby Bells local monopoly. You had cable in the mix with very different interests in the Bells as well. Today, there's no more old AT&T and MCI. They were allowed to merge back with the Bells. Um, and, and who are also the dominant wireless companies, and cable essentially has you know, become very closely aligned with the interests of the Bells as well. So there's no real giant versus giant dynamic like we had before. You know, so, Kenneth, my, my question for you is, uh, you know, how, how can the public's voice be heard a little bit better, and, and how can we protect the public interest uh, if Congress does uh, uh, revisit the issue of, of rewriting the Communications Act? I'm trying once again. I, I've, I didn't do. Uh, I'm trying once again to to steer clear of how to lobby Congress and how to um, make your voice heard. It's that's a topic I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, one of those nice little ethics laws um, that Congress has for their staff to do these kinds of things. What I will say though is that um, when the when it's 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 always fascinating to hear how members react to learning that their constituents are caring about an issue. When they meet with members of Congress, when, when, whenever Congress meets with, with a person or constituent in their local district about an issue that they might not have been very familiar with, um, it's very interesting to see how they react to that kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat almost of, of lobbying, right? Where, um, where, the, where the interested person, where the constituent talks about an issue that the member hasn't thought of and brings up the three or four talking points that they would never necessarily get from somebody who they would normally meet with on an issue, say net neutrality. Um, the usual gang of suspects are the network operators who often come in with, uh, with their talking points, and that might be the only perspective they might have heard on that issue for weeks or months, potentially even for their entire congressional career. When somebody meets with um, the, with, with the member or their staff on presenting the other perspective, um, you have the opportunity directly to influence how, uh, how, th how they potentially could see the issue, which potentially could result in, in a change of their position. Colin, is that a best yeah. way? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess my, my main concern is in the 96 Act, I don't think the public interest was on the top of the minds of, of, of Congress either then. I just think it was – some good things happen as a byproduct of industry warring against each other. And I'm kind of worried this time that there is no other big giant to, to sort of have this byproduct. Well, there, I mean, there were obviously different companies on different sides of the debate to set up, you know, the paradoxes I talked about earlier. Uh, consumer and public interest groups were absolutely part of the debate because they testified 
uh, at numerous hearings, more than they probably wanted to, because uh, we held lots of hearings about uh, in the run-up uh, to, uh, to legislating. Um, the difference now is that there, um, the other way to think about it is, uh, Derek, is uh, this way, which is the paradox for the public interest community, which is that the public interest community is siloed. If you're working on climate change issues, you think you're just working on climate change issues. If you're working on affordable health care, healthcare, high quality health care issues, if you're working on education issues, you consider yourself part of the public interest in that silo. And the reality here is that the common communications medium for the nation and making sure that it is open for uh, civic engagement, for public debate, for reaching your representatives, for organizing locally and within a community, is as important to you whether you are working on climate change, educational issues, affordable health care. There is a broader public interest community that can now use the communications medium effectively to organize than ever existed uh, when we were working on the 1996 Telecom Act. That's real power. It hasn't been tapped that way because in large part the public interest community remains as siloed as we've, uh, you know, diagnosed uh, some of the implementation of the act itself. Uh, but if you break down those public interest silos and everybody realizes that, uh, you know, as somebody who cares deeply about uh, the environment and, and clean energy or somebody who cares about uh, affordable, high-quality health care or education reform or immigration reform, uh, uh, any of these issues, uh, that they have a stake in the outcome of this debate because getting these policies right is a condition precedent to success on all of those other issues. And that's also something that is, is the work uh, ahead of us. If you're going to rewrite the Telecom Act, uh, then you, you want to do this work uh, as well to make sure you put yourself in the most advantageous position with respect to your local representatives and senators to talk to them very broadly about the importance of these networks and these services to the country. So, Susan, I, that kind of leads to, the, I have a question for you. So, um, what priorities should policymakers have in, in mind as they rewrite the act, and what should, what should the public be telling them? Well, just to jump off what Colin just said, uh, not only do we live in, live in a deeply fractured society where uh, groups seem unable to talk to each other, uh, we're facing a rhetoric of uh, market, you know, the, the rhetoric of the free market that an individual can succeed on his or her own and that anything uh, that talks about collective action is somehow less than. Uh, so the battle is actually even greater than convincing the public interest groups that they have shared interests, but in somehow addressing systematically through research and uh, policy, uh, you know, unification and uh, empirical studies, the benefit of a uh, powerful communications infrastructure for all that is just as important as clean water uh, and clean air and a, a fine education to have a communications infrastructure that's functioning well. And we've, uh, we have such a great distance to travel along these lines. It, it uh, does get depressing every once in a while. But um, 10 years from now, if Europe, your European countries or the developed Asian nations have an internet infrastructure that we don't have, which looks quite likely right now, they will come up with the next Google. They will come up with the next great uh, innovation that will transform their societies, and we won't be doing that. So I'm hoping that not only can we achieve uh, our goals in terms of responding to the free market rhetoric uh, uh, by pointing out that we actually have great inequality in this country for uh, communications, education, health, and everything else, but that also we can convince ourselves that having a, a truly functional high-speed communications infrastructure will help us as a nation. Um, towards these, we really need a national strategy for broadband. I know we wrote one last year, uh, but it would be good to um, uh, look at that again, perhaps, and, and think uh, about what the priorities for getting to a truly high-speed infrastructure that could rival what Asia's already got and uh, what the European nations already have. A key step there will be shared infrastructure in these highly concentrated markets. Uh, these are, by nature, natural monopoly um, systems, transmission systems in, in local neighborhoods. Nothing evil about that inherently, just that it gives the carriers enormous gatekeeper control and also makes it very difficult for anybody else to enter and compete with them. 
So if we know the competition is going to push along a better internet for all of us, we, that infrastructure has to be shared. Um, but we have a paradox, and this is one of Collins' uh, ways, framings of things, that, that we have an interesting paradox in communications policy. Heavily concentrated markets and high-speed infrastructure in municipalities, but underserved areas in a lot of the rest of the country. And there, we have to be subsidizing fiber between uh, internet exchange points and many different regions of the country, driving up traffic volumes, making it possible for people in more remote areas to have very high-speed access. We've got a problem, which is that carriers can't charge very much. This is a paradox. Carriers can't charge very much for very long-haul transmissions. Their costs that they, they can charge only about uh, a megabit, a, a dollar per megabit per month. So it's not worth it for them to install the 100 gigabit ports that we need across the country to bring high speeds to everyone for these very long lines to get the traffic volumes that make them have the incentives to install fiber to more of America, we've got to subsidize links between internet, con internet backbones and uh, towns that are underserved. That's a big step, and I hope we get there so that everybody has an incentive to upgrade the internet infrastructure we have throughout the country. A third priority should be supporting municipal networks. We keep talking about the federal level as if that's all that matters for telecommunications. There's a lot of nasty stuff happening on the state level, uh, where, as you've probably heard, there are lots of laws uh, barring municipalities from helping themselves to um, open access fiber rings. Whatever we can do to make it easier for those municipal networks to survive and thrive is also going to be very important. Um, Another priority should be understanding step by step the economics of each link in our infrastructure chain. We're operating in the dark as policymakers. A lot of the time we've had inadequate hearings, you know, lack of understanding of how expensive or inexpensive it is to provide internet access, fiber access to each person in the country. As part of the broadband plan, uh, somebody estimated it cost $350 billion to bring truly high speed internet access infrastructure to Americans. I think it's more like 50 billion. That's still a lot of money, but we spend amounts like that routinely without, you know, collapsing as a country. So there must be some way to bring real economic uh, evidence to bear on the internet infrastructure question. And understanding the lack of economics of some of the network operators' arguments would be important. All this talk about usage-based billing and the necessity to recapture their costs is based on not much evidence. And we should know a lot more about that than we do. So from my perspective, the top priorities are changing the rhetoric, opening up infrastructure, uh, subsidizing fiber links to local communities, um, supporting municipal broadband as much as possible, and doing the hard spade work that's necessary to understand the economics of every possible link in the in internet infrastructure chain. Great, so we've got a half hour left and I've got lots of great questions uh, that have come up from the audience and from Twitter, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna address some of these questions to the panel. Um, one is, Congress and staffers have repeatedly said that an overhaul of the act is highly unlikely. And certainly these things take time and I, I, I would be skeptical it could happen very quickly. So, um, you know, wh what are the individual issues that you think could be addressed by this Congress and what should be the focus of communications policy today, Kenneth? Well, I think um, what, what people are talking about hearing this year, would, or seeing this year, would, um, there's a couple different major pieces. Um, one is, at least in the House side, they're potentially approaching FCC reform, uh, which could potentially, some fear, um, some members fear, it would lead to the decimation of the agency um, and uh, even no matter who would be in charge of it and, and uh, removing their ability to enforce uh, consumer protections all across the board um, for our media policy, for in our media. Um, the other major piece of legislation that's being debated is how to provide a nationwide broadband network for public safety. Um, it was the last major recommendation of the 9-11 Commission. We're coming to right about 10 years of, after 9-11. Um, how that debate shapes up where uh, it was actually there was a bipartisan draft of a bill that in the House side, with um, the top Republican Mr. Barton and the top Democrat Mr. Waxman, came together on an idea that could potentially help build a broadband network for uh, for public safety users that could also lead to new competition for consumers. 
that is a, they have, in particular, that's a very different approach than the Senate took in their introduced bill. Um, and we can get into the details of that if you want, but I'm just trying to name some ideas of things that could come up in the past, in the next couple of years. Um, but in terms of media reform itself, um, in, in less of about broadband networks and the internet, uh, there's not been much that's been under debate for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, it does, it does seem that, that on, on that, which is a very important issue and we should probably get into for a second, that, that um, there was a large push by, the, by the, uh, the broadcasters and the newspaper owners, certainly around 2002 and, and even probably just as intense around 2006 at the FCC to, to get out from under a lot of the, the, the existing broadcast ownership rules. Um, I, I would argue that we pretty much won that fight or mostly won that fight in 2006 and there were some changes made but they were much, much less vast than the changes that were proposed in, in, uh, in 2002. But um, uh, mass media ownership rules, and this is, this is a question from the audience, mass media ownership rules uh, that are under 202H have to be reviewed every four years. It appears uh, like these rules take forever to get done at the agency. I can personally speak to that. It's 2011. We started the 2010 review last year, and I don't think really anything of consequence has happened. Um, so it takes forever at the agency to get, get it done. Then we spend another two, three years in court litigating it. Uh, if there was a communications rewrite, should we eliminate 202H, which is the provision that requires the FCC to review these rules every four years? Does any, um, anyone on the panel want to speak to that? You know, I don't, I, I'm not a, a big fan of compulsory reviews. Uh, if changes in the marketplace uh, and uh, changes in technology warrant uh, the commission recalibrating its rules for whatever reason, the commission always has the ability uh, on its own motion or by petition to review its rules and to change them. Uh, the built-in uh, 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 forcing of a review uh, against a standard uh, that is very ambiguous uh, is what has been problematic in, the, in those reviews in the past. The fact that the reviews are so sweeping uh, is the reason why they're not ever done on time. Uh, so uh, I, I, would, I would be in favor of getting rid of it, leaving the commission with that flexibility uh, to change as, as change may be, uh, uh, be uh, required, uh, but not going through uh, those um, exercises uh, every four years. I think the other thing to remember is that even though the 1996 Telecom Act set up those mass media ownership uh, reviews, um, uh, there was bipartisan consensus at that time that some rules were still necessary. And so even though the initial proposal was to get rid of all of them, by the time we reached the finish line, there were members of both parties who were suggesting, well, we should put some of these rules back, make the commission review them, um, and, um, and, and that is a slight change from where you see the rhetoric um, uh, today. The other important thing, going back to the question you asked, uh, Susan, about um, antitrust law, is um, the Telecom Act also included a, an ownership prohibition and put it in the statute, which is the prohibition that local phone companies and local cable companies cannot buy, them, buy each other out in region. This was a debate because there were some uh, uh, folks back uh, in the early 1990s who were suggesting that if you just let the phone company and the cable company merge, they would then have the size and scope necessary to create one big fat pipe uh, to deliver uh, all of these wonderful services to everybody. And so uh, that was rejected, and instead a preference for competition uh, was enshrined in the Act, and we didn't rely on antitrust law. It's in the Communications Act. Um, and so that, that prohibition is what gives us our two-wire worlds, and what we wanted was both of those wires vigorously competing and both wires wide open uh, you know, for uh, communications and speech and free enterprise and free expression. Uh, and that was the model of the, of the act at the time. But I think a built-in review against a, uh, a fairly ambiguous standard, I think, is an exercise that even the commission staff uh, who have to go through it, uh, you know, sort of lament the exercise because it is very time-consuming. 
I've been through this in other bureaucratic organizations. This is just like jump rope. You know, you just keep trying to get into the game, and then you work on the report, and you never know where you are. And so it's it's not, it just it amounts to a lot of spinning of wheels uh, with a very little certainty and drives down morale at the agency, too. Colin, can I, Colin, can I ask you just a quick question about the point you, you just raised? If 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 the act had been successful and, and, and successfully implemented and reviewed by the courts, very few people remember that we had hundreds of potential, uh, actually existing local phone companies that existed for your business, um, and dial-up ISPs by the thousands. Had that, mo if we had, al if Congress had allowed a cable company and phone company to merge and created one pipe in a, in a home, could we have sustained through the courts that kind of open access model where there would be hundreds of new ISPs or hundreds of providers of service over that same wire, and would we be in a better competitive spot than we right now are, where there's at best two providers for wireline service? You'd have to regulate it within an inch of its corporate life. Um, and the danger that we uh, were responding to was the danger, remember, the, the antitrust case that broke up Ma Bell began in the Gerald Ford administration, was continued through the Jimmy Carter administration, and was concluded by the Reagan administration. And so there was some consensus within antitrust circles, certainly, uh, that the case had merit. At the time, AT&T had 1.2 million employees. It was the largest employer in the United States. And so going back to an era where you had one big fat pipe and one company would bring you back to Ernestine. Um, and you could theoretically say, you could theoretically say, well, we'll have an open access rule and everybody will get access and we'll make sure that happens. But what you would also put at risk then is this. You would be in a situation where one change of a regulation, one change of a, of a law um, would have a, a counter theory take place, which is you don't need to regulate that because, of course, they have so much capacity. Why would they ever discriminate against anybody's packets or bits? There would be no reason to, because they have so much capacity in that one big fat pipe. So you don't need any rules. You're just holding back uh, innovation by doing that. And we had heard these arguments before. They were rejected. We did have two, a two-wire world. The reason why we got DSL on the phone line uh, was because the cable guys got into the market to um, offer cable modem service. Why, in part, did they do that? One reason was we preempted, uh, you know, 25 or 26 states that had prohibited them from getting into that market in those states. But the other reason why they did that was the 1992 Cable Act, which created digital services from satellite that were competing against their basic video product to the home. Their distinguishing ability in the marketplace of having a wire that could also offer broadband services what propelled them into that business in part to contrast their services from the DBS satellite companies. The competition we created in one sector led to uh, competition in another sector. That was very, very healthy. So our model was working. And in the 19, late 1990s, uh, it, it, it was paying dividends both in investment and innovation uh, and uh, benefits to the American people. Um, we, we, got, we went astray from that model, in part because of the courts, in part because of regulatory decisions. What would happen if we went back to that? Well, you'd go back to it and you would find the kind of competition you find elsewhere where people took up our act and actually continue to implement it in other countries. Susan, did you have thoughts on that? Well, just to pick up on that, I, I think that uh, the dream of a two-wire world has turned out just to not, not work out, not because of any mistakes by Congress, but just because it's so much cheaper to upgrade cable than it is to upgrade a, a copper phone line. And so it, it's so expensive to dig up the streets and put in fiber that it's, it's not happening for most of America. I think about 10% of us will have access to Verizon's file service, and we love it, but it, that's not enough. So. The two-wire world, we have to face the fact that the two-wire world has not worked out. We've got a local cable monopoly. We're in the position of having to provide competition uh, through structural separation and uh, all the unbundling that other countries around the world have done. So um, I hope that uh, we can move on um, uh, into 
in, unfortunately, the world that Colin suggests is regulating these guys within an inch of their life is exactly what needs to happen. <clears throat> okay, another question from uh, the audience. Um, you discussed a lack of choice as one of the main causes that spurred the 96 rewrite. It seems like the same thing is happening again with consumers. Uh, they will only have the choice between Verizon or AT&T for wireless service. This is a real problem that will have a major effect ultimately on the consumer. What do you think needs to happen to combat this? So this is the this is a pretty topical question. Um, you know, we Colin did mention we used to have two phone companies, two two cellular companies. They Congress tried to pry that open to create more. There were a lot more, and then slowly the industry has been it's back to the future. <laughs> it's back to the future. Industry has been consolidating, <laughs> and now it looks like we're about to head from from four national carriers, where two are pretty heavy at the top, to basically two very, very big national carriers heavy at the top that also happen to be major wire providers and own a lot of the middle mile infrastructure that Susan had mentioned earlier. So, so for, for the panel, um, you know, is the T-Mobile uh, acquisition an issue, and uh, what needs to happen on, on this to ensure that consumers uh, and Americans uh, are, are not uh, left worse for it? Yeah, and it's obviously an issue. When you go, you know, four is, better than three, three is better than two, two is better than one. Uh, and so um, it, it'll obviously be an issue, you know, the antitrust division gets the uh, first crack at it, uh, and um, uh, we'll see what they say, and then obviously the FCC, uh, you know, will have to review it under their public interest uh, model. But we're back to, as Susan was, um, you know, outlining, you have two companies, uh, you know, you have two wires uh, in each community providing services. Um, you have essentially uh, two wireless carriers in each uh, community uh, providing services. Uh, a couple of things that the National Broadband Plan talked about, um, and Susan alluded to uh, one of them, was community broadband efforts. Um, and the second thing that was, uh, in addition to the community broadband efforts, one of the things that the National Broadband Plan um, uh, suggested uh, was um, that there should be a national allocation of unlicensed spectrum in a contiguous uh, allocation. Uh, and we've had great success with the uh, uh, allocations of unlicensed spectrum where we've had it. We've had some progress made on the so-called white spaces um, in the in the in the broadcasters uh, video bands, um, but getting a national allocation if any new spectrum comes back uh, will also be very very important if that can remain in unlicensed uh, form. Very difficult trick to pull off in the context of a budget deficit, um, uh, and, and again that will take some organizing and and some effort. But if you're looking for antidotes uh, to the consolidation. Part of it will come from uh, using the assets that you have, uh, your access to public rights of way, uh, your ability to you know, provide community broadband service, access to spectrum. But we did have a time where there were companies like COVAD and, and others that were providing competing DSL and, and broadband services to consumers. Uh, you did have a time where there were ISPs who had access uh, to a wholesale platform. Um, you know, the, the, the lack of choice, I think, will be pronounced uh, more and more over time, and that was one of the things that led to the Telecom Act of 1996, that frustration. Uh, you know, there is uh, concern about a lack of choice in many small business markets. If you talk to people who might own a, lo a local travel agency or uh, a local small business enterprise, another thing that the National Broadband Plan talked about was wholesale unbundling in that small business market. Um, uh, you know, so there were several elements of the broadband plan that if you, if you did them together uh, and worked on them uh, would have a, uh, a very beneficial uh, effect going forward. Uh, but I would say that, remember, the Telecom Act of 96 was a combination of a multi-year effort, and it took a lot of organizing around uh, these principles and harnessing the frustration to get to uh, uh, the, the assigning ceremony. Uh, and a lot of the spade work still needs to be done on the organizing side and on uh, really uh, identifying uh, uh, people in the community who would benefit uh, from changes in the law. People in the community, businesses and others, who right now 
are losing battles in Washington they don't even know they're in. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another uh, aspect of this uh, uh, debate, making sure that we get the, uh, the transparency and the, uh, the attention to it. So um, I'm glad you mentioned the national broadband plan and, and one aspect of it, and I'm going to uh, pitch this question to Kenneth and, and tweak it a little bit. Um, the question is, don't we have evidence that community co-ops have successfully provided critical infrastructure, such as the Rural Electrification Act of 1936? Community-owned nonprofit models uh, to provide broadband uh, seem to be missing in the overall dialogue. Shouldn't a community have the right to, to choose the business-neutral uh, model of their choice? And, and Kenneth, it, you know, a few years back, you know, this was, a, this was a recommendation of the broadband plan, but even a few years back before that, there did seem to be some type of bipartisan some bipartisan consensus around the issue of that states shouldn't be allowed to ban municipalities from being self-reliant and, and, and if they chose to, uh, to provide critical services that the, the incumbents wouldn't provide. Uh, but now we see, uh, it, it, you know, in North Carolina, they're trying to, to ban uh, the community broadband there. So, you know, is there any prospect that we could get some bipartisan support for, for that effort to tell states that they, they can't really tell citizens they can't be self-reliant? I'm a little bit biased. I grew up in the South, and much of the South is publicly owned utilities. Um, and so I got to, you know, watch television in the dark, or at least uh, watch television at night, thanks to a, a community-owned municipal utility. Um, it's the state efforts to fight community broadband plans across the country was a bit of a policy fad for between like 2004 until 2007, eight, nine. And I, I guess it kind of gone away. I had forgotten about the I – mean, not saying I forgot about the issue, but forgotten about the states were interested in, in stopping local governments from taking control of their broadband pl uh, futures. And, and then all of a sudden North Carolina and the Carolinas came back up. Um, there had been uh, some bipartisan efforts to, to address, I guess, preempting states who, would inter who were trying to preempt cities from rolling out broadband, uh, uh, broadband uh, networks. The um, some of the requirements that the conditions that were required to get uh, bipartisan support were just seemed to be almost as, as onerous as the state restrictions in the first place, um, in terms of how a community would go about assessing the need, seeking public support. Um, that the the issue kind of died. Now I know Mr. Markey had introduced a, a bill not back in '07. I'm guessing is that the year. Um, that would have f been a federal preemption on that. And then, like most uh, you know, good pieces of legislation, kind of fizzled away at the vine and couldn't get enough support to move out of the committee, much less through the House and through the Senate. Um, you know, that's just, it's just one of those things that hasn't really been, been on, the, on the radar for quite some time because states hadn't been, except for where they were successful in that initial burst, the, 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 the number of states that were trying to pass that had really slowed down. What about, what about them? I mean, well, the state legislature is targeting locally owned networks, government owned networks. We're talking about independent rural co ops, the old 1936 rural electrification in Montana. Well, I mean, co ops are how much of much of the, much of several, several parts of rural America are, are, are connected via telephone networks. Um, I mean, there's a lot of co ops, and particularly in Texas um, and throughout the Midwest, that are cooperative, you know, they're co ops. Um, nothing, to my knowledge, Susan or Colin, that, that restricts them from from, commu from from volunteers connecting themselves. In fact, that's how Urbana-Champaign has wireless, you know, wireless broadband themselves, um, thanks to very in, um, interested people wanting to build a, a Wi-Fi mesh network. Um, you know, that's one of those things where in D.C. we don't do always ourselves, but we certainly, I, at least, I, I enjoy seeing it happen in, in communities all across the country. Yeah, you know, I think I think there. The, the issue of co-ops and, and, and people putting up their own networks and, and communities banding together and putting up wireless towers is incredibly important. Uh, you know, from, from my study and my perspective, a lot of the barriers there, you know, they, they can put up a tower, they can put up a network in the last mile, but they've got to get that traffic back to Internet exchange points. And, in, and certainly in a lot of these rural areas, the only, only option for them is the leftover company, whoever the local Bell phone company was, uh, back during the monopoly era, and though some of those lines and rates are regulated, uh, they're for the most part, uh, you know, some of the profit margins on those are in the 70, 80 percent 
level. And so this is an issue that I think uh, was a part of the national broadband plan that was supposed to be addressed. They've kind of kicked the can down the road. They haven't really brought it up yet. Um, certainly, uh, there was a lot, a big portion of what the, the BTOP stimulus program in commerce did was to, uh, you know, look at a lot of these areas that basically had, they were still using copper lines that were falling apart to get to get this traffic back to the internet backbone and, and going in there and building fiber exchange points and fiber loops. Uh, I think that's going to help a little bit, but I think it's it's a much bigger problem than we realize, and certainly there's going to need to be some regulatory reform in order to do that. I don't know if anyone on the panel wants to address this. Just say two things. I mean, um, so the, the two key inputs that you named, one of them, it's access to the back end, the back hall, um, which right now the FCC is debating or has, has pen is, 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 is poised to begin debating special access reform, which is reform that would, of the networks that connect from, say, a wireless tower to the back end internet network, um, which is often controlled by uh, the local phone company. And then it's access to spectrum to make sure that you have the ability to actually get from the tower to the consumer on a way, on, on, a, on a device that they can actually use. And what we're seeing right now, I live in a neighborhood in DC that has 15, 16 wireless Wi-Fi networks in there. So you've got to figure out a way to create more unlicensed spectrum so that would allow for for actual broadband infrastructure development instead of a whole lot of hot spots conflicting with each other. Okay, um, I guess since we're bouncing around here and you just were talking about spectrum, uh, another question from the audience. I've heard that the idea that uh, bandwidth isn't really scarce. If this is true, how do we uh, communicate to the general public in a, in a, in a simple way? And I, you know, I think that's, that's a, certainly important on the wired side, but I, I would also extend that question to to the wireless side, because a lot of the debate we have in Washington now is about the the, the spectrum crunch, the wireless crunch, and uh, you know while there may be some truth to that, uh, unfortunately in Washington when you throw on words like crisis, uh, that tends to open the door for people to, to game the system to their own advantage. So, uh, you know, Susan is bandwidth scarce, and uh, you know if, if that's if that's a falsehood, uh, how do we do a better job of communicating the fact that bandwidth actually is not scarce? We love to use the term the looming spectrum crisis, which is three pretty powerful words in a row. And I'm, I'm not as, I think the real crisis is the one that Kenneth has identified, which is insufficient capital investment in backhaul and, uh, you know, the, the, the towers. In order to have wireless access that would actually compete uh, with high-speed wired access, you'd have to have a lot more towers. You have to be standing right next to them and be the only guy using the tower. But uh, because wireless operates in such a high, harsh environment and is subject to so much interference, towers have to be very close to users and fiber has to come deep into neighborhoods to make this work. Somehow incentivizing car carriers to invest there is what's needed. Um, and to invest in a way that makes those towers then available to any unlicensed use or other retail uses, that would open up wireless access in this country. I think focusing so much on uh, spectrum is perhaps uh, shining a light on uh, the wrong part of the problem. Uh, there's been an enormous administration push in this area, so we'll see more and more discussion of it. But for me, opening up more unlicensed, making sure there's more backhaul, greater capital investment in towers is where you're actually going to get the bang for your buck on the wireless side. Um, Colin, I got a, I got a question for you. Um, and, you know, this question comes up a lot uh, when, when I do panels like this, and I, you know, I think it's an important one to, to discuss. Um, it's a little it's a little off topic, but I, I think it's important. Um, you know, you work for Ed Markey, who's very very well known as a, a champion of the environment uh, and, and handles a lot of environmental issues and environmental causes. Uh, the question from the audience is: Is anyone in DC worried about the radiation health effects of cell towers and Wi-Fi? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the, it's. Um, uh, when I worked for Congressman Markey, Markey had commissioned two GAO reports on that very question. Um, and uh, at the time uh, that the GAO did the analysis of the scientific data at that time, um, what came back was a, a series of studies that uh, were not uh, leading one way or another as to uh, whether you could make a conclusion about the health and safety effects of uh, the uh, wireless devices and the like. Uh, 
What those GAO um, reports did result in, though, was a clarification of the different roles of agencies with respect to this topic. The FCC is not a health agency. The FCC is not going to assess uh, the, the, the health effects of devices on uh, the, the human person. Uh, those issues are dealt with by the Food and Drug Administration. And the Food and Drug Administration has a, an office of radiological devices and health. They share their boxes together? Yes, they do. And um, the FCC um, basically gets uh, its uh, uh, regulations about what is safe and not, uh, what, what's safe and not safe from uh, the FDA, which also is uh, talking to the EPA. So the job of those agencies is to make sure they're fully coordinated on this question. I know that in Europe, uh, several of the countries have taken uh, an additional step where they've looked at uh, several countries of the effect on uh, children uh, to the extent to which uh, growing um, uh, uh, kids uh, will be uh, affected differently than an adult with respect to these devices, and obviously more and more kids um, are, are, are getting these devices, lots of latchkey kids in particular. It's how they stay in touch with their, uh, their parents. And as the, as, the, um, uh, as the parent of two little boys, I know um, uh, their mother, uh, for one, would like to put a GPS device on them uh, uh, from time to time just to know where they are. So uh, this will be an ongoing issue. I think it's a good question to raise. I think the GAO reports that Markey had done are probably now several years old. The, the, the GAO had required the FDA and the FCC to have a joint website uh, to update the public on uh, this information. So that would be a good uh, place to uh, revisit and see if they're uh, uh, updating that health information on a timely basis and if any of that information from those studies uh, they believe warrants the changes in any of the regs or the or the standards for these devices. It's certainly, an it's something that we would all we would all like to yeah, know. Yes, certainly an important topic and one where I think uh, the benefit of of, of, of hard science yeah. can definitely help inform the debate. Um, uh, one more question from the audience. Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about antitrust here, and I think this is actually a pretty clever question. Um, should a new telecom act move enforcement of the act to the Justice Department? So the same agency is not charged to make policy and then enforce existing policy and law. Um, any thoughts on that, panelists? It's interesting. You know, if, if you look at the uh, FTC as another model of an independent agency, um, they they have very limited enforcement um, resources, and so what they do is try to lead by example by going after one or two companies and making sure that all the other lawyers hear about the consumer protection issues that they've raised or the antitrust issues, and that seems to work pretty well for them. I, I think the question raises a very good point, which is that the enforcement abilities of the FCC are quite limited, which is why it's been so important to pair up closely with the Department of Justice on things like the Comcast-NBC merger and now the AT&T T-Mobile merger. Um, what I worry about is whether the expertise of the agency in the technical areas that it learns about by regulating uh, would adequately be transferred over to the enforcement arm and there'd be so many opportunities for gaming um, uh, between, between those stools that I'm concerned about moving all this uh, out of the agency. By the way, I met with a bunch of Chinese academics this week and they said that the different parts of their Internet regulator, they don't speak to each other. They came from different silos, just the thing we have in the FCC. We tend to think of uh, China as having this almost perfect uh, um, regulation mechanism. And uh, they have the same uh, DNA issues as uh, we do, for what it's worth. That was my question, but just to ask you, is it not Yeah, the, I mean, that really would be, I mean, there's two two issues. One, I think you're, uh, I think you're accurate with, re with respect to uh, uh, the enforcement track record. And I think I any, any um, uh, study that looked at when a complaint was filed, you know, uh, and, and when they were resolved would be a very, very long uh, time frame. It is a real issue for the agency. Um, it's an agent, uh, and, and, and for, the, for the staff and the budget resources they have uh, to look at uh, uh, complaints uh, 
and to adjudicate them. In many instances, you run the risk uh, if you're a small uh, company, a, a small operator against a, uh, a behemoth in the marketplace, you may file a complaint uh, and seek enforcement action at the agency, and by the time it goes through the entire process, you may be posthumously vindicated, um, but you're, you're long out of business, right? Um, and so that, making sure that the agency is fleet-footed on enforcement is, is very, very important. Uh, part of that can be done if Congress sets deadlines uh, in the law and says you have to you know, uh, adjudicate these things within so many days, and if the agency doesn't, then parties reserve the right to go to court. Uh, because many times you can't go to court until the agency has dealt with it administratively first. And that's where the delay is also quite hurtful. Uh, you can also, um, you know, often get the agency to do more with respect to enforcement if the oversight from Congress is focused on that. And that goes to whether or not the, the, the committees in the House and Senate are on top of the agency and making sure that the commission is doing its job on a timely basis. But it, it takes that kind of coordinated uh, effort. This is not um, unique to the FCC. Um, as Susan noted, other agencies might not, you might complain to uh, the Federal Trade Commission, they simply might not take your case. Um, and so their, their way of dealing with it is to, you know, find somebody, if they get enough complaints about a particular issue, is they go and make an example out of somebody. And that kind of chills everybody in the marketplace and they kind of scram uh, by, you know, banging that nightstick. Uh, on an enforcement uh, mechanism, but uh, uh, it's, it is a problem. And it, it's ultimately, you're right, it's ultimately political. Uh, petitions, uh, complaints are filed at the commission all the time and are stuffed in a drawer because the politicians don't want to deal with the controversy surrounding the petition. You know, the, the Skype petition went to die for there for a while. Uh, Andy Schwartz is in the back of the room. He's filed numerous complaints and petitions, decades old probably now, that have not been dealt with, but uh, shot clocks, I think, are very important. This was one of the, I think, good things about the net neutrality item is, is that there, there was a so-called rocket docket, and if the complaints were filed, the agency did have to address them within a certain period of time. So I think you're going to have to have uh, requirements like that um, in, in order to, to move the agency along, even if they're politically disinclined to deal with such complaints. So we're over time here, so I, I want to thank our panelists who have been very gracious, and thank you, the audience.